discredit. Fans who have been engrossed in a fictional universe so much you could probably earn a degree about it. What plot holes, logical inconsistencies, and the like cannot be reconciled and bother you to no end. The fact that there are two Rumpelstiltskins in the Shrek universe really annoys me and many people seem to not have noticed. We all know the Rumpelstiltskin from the last movie, but in Shrek the third, when Prince Charming enters the poison apple and starts talking to other villains, he actually talks to Rumpelstiltskin. But it's not the same that appears in Shrek Forever After, yep really annoys me. And also, two Sleeping Beauty characters, because she cameos in Shrek 2, also in Shrek 2. If Donkey drank the potion and it was also supposed to affect your true love, why didn't the dragon transform? In some comics of Archie, Veronica has a dog, in others she has a cat, this would be fine, except in other versions she's allergic to cats or hates dogs. Keep your character internally consistent. 10 year old me was not impressed. I grew up with the Bay Transformers films. And while I'll always have a soft spot for the first three holy shit the law might be the worst in all of fiction. In the first film the Owl Spark, a cube that makes Transformers and the cause of the war, lands on Earth in the early 1900s, and it takes the Autobots and Decepticons 100 years to find Earth. Oh wait, no it doesn't because they've been on Earth since at least the 1800s and never thought to look for the very thing the war was all about. Hell the Primes, basically Transformer gods, built their sun eater in Egypt and were buried on the damn planet. How did they not write Earth down in any records if it was an important planet to them? Also did you know that the Transformers were the cause of the space race? And that they were making deals with the CIA and NASA all the way back in the 60s? And they still didn't think to look for Megatron or the Al Spark in that time period? Also the government organization made specifically to research Transformers had no idea about any of that? Oh yeah, Transformers killed the dinosaurs too because Earth was actually being used to mine Transformium, which is what Transformers are made out of. Oh yeah about that, the Al Spark did jack shit all along because other aliens made Transformers. So the war was pointless, and primes are knights now, not gods for some reason. Speaking of knights, did you know that Transformers were at King Arthur's round table? They also fought in both world wars, the American Revolution, they killed Hitler, served the Japanese Empire, etc all along because why the fuck not? Also a goddess named Quintessa made the Transformers, not those other aliens and not the Al Spark, to fight Unicron. Who's Unicron? Well he's the Thanos of the Transformers universe, and he's been Earth all along. Yep, Earth was a Transformer too. Also Cybertron, the planet they are from, is somehow still alright even though it got sucked into a literal black hole in Transformers 3 and blew the fuck up. Oh yeah, about that hole it took 100 years for Autobots to come to Earth thing? Well not only was Optimus and the gang on Earth the whole time, they also forgot about that and didn't come to Earth till the 80s which is still earlier than they arrived in 2007. So we have three different time points for Optimus's army coming to Earth, and two different time points for Megatrons. It's a fucking clusterfuck. Wasn't there a throwaway line in the first movie how the ice around the cube is thousands of years old? I always thought the Al Spark crashed before any of the other stuff happened, and Megatron just found it in the 1900s. In the first movie, they land on Earth, or Tobots and Decepticons. They scan a vehicle and become that vehicle. But they can obviously change again Bumblebee does it, so why would you stay a semi truck or a Camaro and drive everywhere when you could be a freaking jet or helicopter and fly to your objectives in one fifth of the time? There are so many confusing characters franchises to choose as a comic book fan, but I've got to give it to Wonder Woman. For those that don't know, DC tends to do soft reboots every once in a while which makes continuity difficult to parse, but there are usually through lines and little changes are explained by the continuity shift. Currently, they are trying to say all the old stories kind of did happen and the 2011 reboot wasn't actually a hard reboot like they tried to pitch it as. I realize this doesn't appear to make any sense, but in reality, for most characters, it actually works if you don't think too hard. But not for Wonder Woman. Every time they do any kind of reboot, her backstory is completely overhauled. Sometimes not even when there's a continuity excuse. To the point where there are almost as many stories dealing with retconning her origins as there are stories about her doing her superhero thing in the last 10 years. And unlike Hawkman, 
There is no clever way to connect that disparity. Is she a clay golem given life by the gods? Is she the daughter of Zeus? Is she the daughter of Hercules? Who knows? And there's absolutely no way to reconcile the three. Is she a diplomat for Themyscira? Trying to influence the UN to help with world peace? Nope. Because someone recently decided she's never been back to Themyscira since the first time she left. And when was that? World War 1? World War 2? The Cold War? Sliding timescale of a while ago but in modern times? No way to know. Because classic stories have taken place in all those timelines. Really, none of her early stories could have possibly happened due to current retcons. Yet she's been a hero for at least 10 plus years as a Justice League member. So, it's just a waste, is what I'm trying to say. Writers love rewriting Superman's origin but good god does it never stop for Wonder Woman. If they'd give her a few years to breathe and grow as a character instead of changing her origin which inevitably changes again, she'd be much more popular, which she deserves. And at least Superman has two plus ongoing books even when they do decide to take his origin out for a spin in a new miniseries. At least she has her perfect costume, finally. In Futurama, how does Leela not understand why that one guy is a whale biologist? She used to assign people their jobs, because all occupations are based on what you're best at, not what you want. You gotta do, what you gotta do. His response is equally baffling, though hilarious. I don't know you well enough to get into that. I- It was assigned to you. In X-Files there are like three different versions of Samantha's abduction and they all significantly impact the plot and the way Mulder reacts to certain situations. It's my favorite show of all time. But I've always found it annoying that they kept redconning that aspect of the mythic. I know why they did it but it was dumb IMO. I watched all of the X-Files, including the two movies and I still have no fucking idea whether or not aliens exist or if it's just a government conspiracy. I can explain it to you in a few sentences if you want. Remember a lot was retconned poorly and not all of it agrees because later things overwrite the earlier stuff. Basically there are two groups of aliens having a war in space. Black Goo Aliens Hybrid Humans vs The Blind Aliens The Black Goo Aliens want to invade Earth and use us as biomass to grow more soldiers. The government syndicate make a bargain for them to come back in a few decades and we will turn ourselves over peacefully. They take the government's children as collateral. This is mother's sister. In the meantime, the syndicate is doing its own shady stuff in an attempt to block the aliens from invading. The blind aliens come along now and then they kill people that they think are being tested by goo aliens. A lot more happens, but it's basically two alien types fighting with humans stuck in the middle with the occasional giant worm in sewers. Basically anything in Warhammer 40k lore that has to do with scale of measurement. You gotta take the inconsistencies as being part of the setting of a 10,000 year old crumbling galactic empire in which ignorance is a virtue. Everything is canon. Not everything is true. In the original Star Wars a B ones wearing a big robe to hide himself so nobody knows he's a Jedi. But in the prequels they made those robes Jedi robes so now Obi-Wan is literally walking around in Jedi clothing while trying to hide from the Empire. Edit. I'm sure this thread is dead now but thanks for the silver. I mean Obi-Wan lives as a hermit in the desert of Tatooine. The people in Mos Eisley aren't the sharpest tools in the shed so they might not even realize. And he lives virtually isolated from every living being. With a few exceptions every now and then. The only one who knew Obi-Wan used to be a Jedi was Owen after all. Supernatural. Suddenly souls that have been to hell can't go to heaven. Main characters have bounced between both throughout 15 seasons. If I recall correctly didn't Dean do some pretty heinous stuff during his first trip to hell? Like what redeems you enough to get into heaven after that? Especially after you pretty much said fuck you to God's universe breaking turbo curse? Literally became one of the best torturers apparently and hella close to just becoming a demon but we're gonna ignore that I guess. Also, shouldn't he have life lasting PTSD from 40 years of torture and subsequent torturing? Or at least mention it sometime post season 4? No? Okay then. I'm currently quarantined watching all 15 seasons. Currently on season 9. The thing about Supernatural is that once it was unexpectedly renewed after the 5th season, the original story arc by Eric Kripke, it went into uncharted territory. It learned not to take itself too seriously. Sorta like SG-1. Plot holes all over the place, but we're just going to have fun with it. Agree. 
Very next season's clap your hands if you believe has a scene. Why you can't sleep with the hippie chick when your brother has been abducted by aliens. That's one of the funniest scenes I've seen on TV. In I Love Lucy I was always bothered by the same character being named Caroyle Appleby and Lillian Appleby interchangeably, and in season 4, The Hollywood Ark, both within a handful of episodes of each other. Also, for the longest time, since she rediscovered her saxophone, Lucy only ever knew how to play Glowworm until they moved to the country and when practicing with Fred, Ethel and little Ricky, she said the only song she ever knew was Sweets You. Which brings me to my next point. In that same episode, Ethel is bad at the piano and said she only ever learned the song coming round the mountain and never learned sweets you. Problem is, Ethel is, was, good at the piano. She played and sang sweets you with Fred Ricky, and Lucy in an early season. It wasn't until a later season when she and the Wednesday Afternoon Fine Arts League formed an orchestra that she lost her ability and could barely play 12th Street Drag. Also, Everyone and their mother on that show had one of two phone numbers Circle 7 2099 and Murray Hill 5 9099. Edit. Also, Freddie Fillmore, the actor's mannerisms inspired the Miley's guy on The Simpsons, has met Lucy and Ricky multiple times on multiple iterations of his radio programs Mr. and Mrs. Quiz. Females are fabulous, etc. Either he's horrible at keeping one on the air consistently or he was that era's Ryan Seacrest. In Clue, Yvette allegedly crept up behind Mr. Body and killed him with the candlestick while all of the other guests were examining the cook's body in the kitchen. She then managed to balance the murder weapon perfectly on the door frame so that it would fall on Wadsworth's head. First, she was wearing heels. How's she sneaking up on anybody, let alone Mr. Body, on those hardwood floors? Okay, maybe she took her heels off. That would make sense and easier to sneak. But then, secondly, how this 5 feet 3 inches French maid managed to perfectly balance a candlestick on the narrow edge of the door frame with a standard height of 6 feet 8 inches? It just doesn't add up. And don't even get me started on how someone of her size would manage to drag a corpse 40 feet, then prop said corpse up against the door, without managing to get blood all over herself or the floor. Still, funny movie though. In the original King Kong, apparently the locals built this giant wall around their city to keep Kong out, right? So why is there a Kong sized door in the wall? At some point they must have said, we need to build a wall big enough to keep out the giant ape. I know, let's put a huge door in it and then we'll just lock it. Isn't the door to allow him access to the human sacrifices they offer up to placate him? Why not just carry the human sacrifice out a human sized door? You've probably heard this one before, but in Harry Potter, Hogwarts was built before the invention of the sink, or basin, whatever you want to call it. However, the Chamber of Secrets, built at the same time as the rest of the castle, uses a sink as its method of entry. So how did Salazar Slytherin create an entrance to the chamber using a form of indoor plumbing that wouldn't exist for centuries to come? Contractor, hey, we found this secret entrance to some cave while we were remodeling the bathroom. What should we do? Boss, we're not being paid to do anything below ground. If it was secret before just make it look secret when you're done. Did you hear how JK Rowling tried to explain away how wizards went to the toilet before toilets and plumbing were invented? She says that they basically just pissed and shit their pants and then magicked the poo wee away. Not kidding. Look it up. I'm ashamed that it took me this long to find something about this fucking amazing plot detail. Like when they got there where they just told hey there's no bathrooms so just shit yourself and magic it away. Bionicle's story was spread and retold throughout different pieces of media, so there were sometimes conflicting versions of events. For example, in the book version of the final battle the main villain's head was broken in by a piece of a moon, while in the comics the whole thing just got smashed into the back of his head. Edit. Oh. And decanonizing the concept of love didn't make a lot of people happy. Don't forget the whole debacle with the Shadow Toa where the version of the story we were actually told was decanonized and the canon version of events was just mentioned in a guidebook somewhere. Pokemon O. Oh. Where to begin? Let's just talk about Cubone. Cubone is said to wear the skull of its dead mother. However, if you breed Cubone, it's born with the skull already on its head, and its mother is still alive and well. So how is Cubone wearing its mother's skull? 
I love the theory that all the Pokédex entries are written by the 10 year olds the professors send out so that's why you get Pokémon that are supposedly hotter than the sun or the 80 foot whale that only weighs like a thousand pounds. Because kids have no sense of physics or scale. Edit. It seems I was wrong about Whale Lord being off. I'll admit my interest in Pokémon was really only the first two generations. How about things like Pidgeot flying at Mach 2? Onyx weighed 463 pounds. Rhydon is listed 6 foot 3, 264 pounds and states Rhydon's horn can crush even uncut diamonds. One sweeping blow of its tail can topple a building. This Pokemon's hide is extremely tough. Even direct cannon hits don't leave a scratch. Pirates of the Caribbean. This is annoying me to no end. But in Dead Men Tell No Tales they completely rewrite Jack's history by saying he got his compass from his old captain. When in Dead Man's chest it's explained that he got it from Shia Dulma. She literally says, why didn't you use the compass I gave you Ugh. Even worse, in a deleted scene from At World's End and later in a book, it was established that Jack wasn't always a pirate, he used to be a trader, until the East India Company hired him to deliver a load of slaves to the Caribbean. Jack couldn't do it and freed them, which is why the company branded him as a pirate as punishment and burned his ship down. Jack then made a deal with Davy Jones to get his ship back, that's why the pearl was black, from the fire, and why Davy Jones wanted Jack to give him 100 souls for his freedom, because Jack had freed 100 slaves, and then in Dead Man he just was a pirate from day one. In Brooklyn Nine-Nine, it was established in season 3, I think lol. That Rosa drives a supercharged R1. That's a Yamaha R1. In a later season, she says something like Yamaha is for pussies but is seen still driving the same bike. Rosa is a riddle, wrapped in an enigma, inside a mystery. I think we misinterpreted what she meant. Rosa is bisexual. Yamaha is for the pussies. She rides the bike to pick up chicks. There was another plot hole I noticed with Holt about when he lies. In season 1 Jay catches him lying because his lip moves, and they do a slow motion gag. Then later on there's an entire episode that hinges on learning what his tell is, which turns out to be using contractions. I watched The Walking Dead up until the motherfucking tiger. I just couldn't handle it. Everyone, and like I mean everyone was scrounging around for food and you're telling me this guy had enough food to feed a fucking tiger. For like IDK how long it was but at least a year or two. That's so much food. Because if he wasn't feeding the tiger then it would for sure kill and eat him. So everyone, all his friends are just cool with feeding this tiger hundreds of pounds of food, just so this one fucking guy can look cool. Ah fuck that. Just so stupid. Also they killed off everyone I cared about. According to the comics, Shiver the tiger can eat walkers, as the virus doesn't affect animals as it does people. Since there are plenty of walkers, food isn't an issue for her. While it doesn't explain it in the show, I would assume it is the same. Star Trek deals with time travel a lot and it only sometimes makes sense. Usually it can be reconciled with some general rules. Timelines in Trek seem to be linear. You can go into the past and change things and it doesn't just create an alternate timeline. It changes the one you are in. This is most easily seen in Star Trek First Contact. When the Enterprise is stuck in a temporal rift as Borg and the past assimilates Earth they see the planet and the present immediately get assimilated. However, there are an infinite amount of alternate timelines and universes. Three of which are most prominent. Prime Timeline is the TV shows. Kelvin Timeline is the 2009 J.J. Abrams reboot. Mirror Universe is just an alternate universe that appears occasionally. Things start to get confusing when the shows actually do time travel. As I've established, timelines in Star Trek are linear. However, the Kelvin timeline actually occurred because a supernova in the Prime timeline shot a bunch of pissed off Romulans from the 2380s back in time to the 2230s of an alternate dimension where they destroyed the USS Kelvin. What is confusing is that according to the writers and what we see in the movie, this event actually somehow changed history before the Kelvin was destroyed. Which is an explanation for why the ships are like twice as big as they should be if they were just regular prime timeline ships. The real explanation is that J.J. Abrams thought Star Trek ships were too small and made them bigger because he has no sense of scale. 
In Star Trek Voyager, the finale of the show established that it took around 20 years for the USS Voyager to get home from the Delta Quadrant. A jaded and bitter Admiral Janeway acquires a Klingon time travel device and goes back in time bearing advanced technology with the intent of bringing Voyager home far earlier and with everyone alive. The problem is, as I've already established, timelines in Star Trek are linear. Literally the moment Admiral Janeway interacts with Captain Janeway and starts to mess with the progress of their voyage, she should cease to exist as the events that led her to that moment no longer happened. Instead, she sticks around long enough to sacrifice herself to destroy the Borg transwarp network and get everyone home safely. Also, earlier in the series a Federation timeship from the 29th century threatened Janeway to stop getting involved in time travel stuff. But they are apparently okay with just letting the 24th century federation skip around 15 years of weapon development and literally crippling the Borg. And mentioning that, they also let the ship's emergency medical hologram return home with a mobile hologram emitter from the 29th century. Not very good time cops. There's definitely others but I'll stop here. In Voyager, it's revealed that 7 of 9, and the Borg in general, have a simple cure for organic death. Anyone who dies can be saved within 48 hours. This ability is only used once, and forgotten about forever after. Much like any other innovation that only works in one episode, and is then forgotten about the next time the same situation occurs. Oh, we're out of power and can't escape. But the shuttlecraft have their own transporter systems running on separate power sources and can get us out of here. But, we already solved it that way two seasons ago. And we can't do that again, so I guess we'll stay here and fight these monsters and let some red shirts die. How are Vulcans not running all of Starfleet and the Federation, with their very long lifespan compared to humans? Once one got a top level position, they would stay there for way longer than most species would. Eventually most positions would end up being them most of the time. Vulcans tend to be insular and not overly ambitious. When Spark was Kirk's first officer it was very unusual for a Vulcan to be in Starfleet despite their role as co-founders of the Federation. They're just not that interested in it and seem to have handed over a lot of control to humans. Arthur the Animated Kids Show Why do anthropomorphic animal people keep regular animals as pets? Like, Arthur and his family of aardvark people have a pet dog that is just a regular little dog. Even though there are dog people characters, what the hell? We can only conclude that these pets are actually just adopted children who have been kept in a non-verbal state and trained for obedience through years of relentless abuse. In Harry Potter, how the fuck did Hagrid's tiny father have sex with a giant? I can always picture him just crawling right in and having a wank. It keeps me up at night. The whole size thing has always weirded me out. The sizes of things never seem to add up to me. Like she, JKR. Says Hagrid's hands are the size of trash can lids but they'd be hugely disproportionate if he's twice as tall as the average man. Like his hands would be more like dinner plates than trash can lids. And there's some weird stuff with Hagrid's size versus Madame Maxime and Hagrid's size versus Grob. Also, what did his dad do when he was a baby? Ma took off already and now dad has this 100 pound infant to care for? The Walking Dead. Gasoline is only good in cars for 6 months, in cans maybe a few years, in pumps, 5 years. They should not have been able to use cars after like year 6. In Zombieland, a comedy, whenever the cast would go into a building they would make noise to draw out and deal with the zombies first then do whatever they wanted. Yet not once does TWD group ever clear out a building first. They stumble into them and someone always either gets bit or nearly gets bit. World War Z it took them 5 minutes to realize magazines strapped on your arms protects you from bites and it seems to be a TWD rule to only wear t-shirts and maybe some leather if you're cool enough. If you stick a pocket knife in a skull, you need both hands and a boot on the head to get it back. And if your weapon had nails on it, it's gone after one use. Barbed wire, not a vast improvement. You risk getting it caught very easily. And finally, they have established multiple times the walkers smell like dead, rotting flesh. If you walk into a room or house that smells like dead rotting flesh, you know what the hell is in there. And if you're walking around the woods and suddenly smell dead rotting flesh, you should know what the hell is near you. There is no reason they should ever sneak up on anyone. 
The one thing that really annoys me about TWD is that human skull seems to be about as strong as a watermelon. Like it takes minimal effort to plunge a pocket knife through someone's skull into their brain. Imagine having a skull that soft, a light fall could leave you permanently brain damaged. I noticed this as well, but I wrote it off as bones could have been degraded as well as flesh. Why do the Pokemon you catch suddenly are okay with you capturing them right after they attacked you? I've been a fan of this franchise for a long time and I've been wondering this for years, because you beat the absolute shit out of them, and they're terrified of you now. Basically, you beat them to within an inch of their lives and then capture them into this tiny little ball. For the foreseeable future, their lives are consumed by that tiny space that they live in. It's all they come to know. The only time they come out is to battle other creatures. In this, they fight their absolute hardest to make their owners proud because if they don't, then they don't get taken out into battle. So, getting taken into battle is positive reinforcement, getting left in the ball is negative reinforcement. So they bond with the trainer because they want to make sure they are getting every tiny little taste of freedom that they possibly can, even if it means risking life and limb fighting for a child's whims. They have Stockholm Syndrome and are being used as pit fighters. Yo. Pokemon is dark as fuck. In Friends, the characters ages and birthdays never sync up. Rachel tells Gunter her birthday is in May, then later says she's an Aquarius. And assuming she is close to Monica's age around the pilot episode, which is 2627, she doesn't turn 30 until season 6. Yep, and Ross was 29 for 3 seasons. The investigation of Percy's mom's boyfriend's disappearance. They barely even question her, and she isn't a prime suspect in his possible murder. This can be explained through manipulation of the mist to fool the mortals. Remember, that shit is like Jedi mind tricks, but can be used on the entire world at once, even fooling demigods on occasion. That and he was turned into a statue. Since there's no way they would believe that's what happened, they would be looking for a body and evidence of a non-magical murder, neither of which exist. In Fallout the fact that no one decides to start cleaning after 200 years. Like yeah, I get it's the apocalypse but why is a 200 year old skeleton in your house? This is what pissed me the hell off about base building in Fallout 4. Apparently people forgot how to measure and make actual squares with wood because even building brand new structures means creating a dilapidated shithole. They've overplayed their gritty wacky wasteland aesthetic. It's demoralizing to be forced to create a settlement out of cigarette cartons and dog shit. I just want a clean fucking floor and a house made of actual building material. Is that so fucking hard? I like the goofy charm that Fallout has, but I wish there were an alternative, more realistic post-apocalypse settlement building game. Like a good one. Hi, thank you for watch video. Remember like, leave comment, subscribe, hit bell, hit bell. Bye.